know at what point you became engaged in King's and Desmond then? Uh, before he did. Um, um, I got a guy called Ross to put up some money to commission a sort of scenario, and, uh, and that's how it came to be. How much did um, you change the script or work on it once, Edmund? Well, uh, Edmund's script was, a, was really a, a, a teleplay with a plot about these bad guys and these good guys, and, um, and it would have worked very well as a teleplay, but it really wouldn't have made an awful lot of sense as, a, as, a, as an item for which you would hope people would be prepared to pay three and a half pounds or whatever the current price is to see. So you had to work on making it a movie from a teleplay. Yeah, and 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 I had I had I had lots of feelings on the subject. You know, I mean, it's a, you know, in a sense, I bought the title. I loved the title, and I loved the quote from John Donne. And uh, we haven't sent any money to the Donne mm -hmm. estate. So what actually did you specifically add to it? Did you um, bring it out to? all the filming that takes place in the city and all the uh, things outside the room. I mean, did the teleplay mean that it took, basically, took place basically in one location and you had to spread it? The teleplay was about uh, a bunch of bad guys who take over these good guys and lose. And I hope the film is not about that. I think that's about the nearest I can give to an answer. I'm not as objective yet as I can be about it. What about the um, casting? Um, say, in the first place, Patrick McGowan is the main star. When he, when you... Well, when I last, you know, by the time I got to, when I really sat down to seriously write it and seriously face the prospect of making it as a picture, there was never any doubt in my mind that the only person, the only English actor who could play Kingsley was Patrick McGowan. Um, I hadn't seen him since the prisoner days, and I didn't know if he was going to accept it or not going to accept it, and, uh, and I thought for a time that if he didn't accept it, I couldn't think what to do, because I, I couldn't see him being replaced by even a very wonderful British actor. It was just, he was Kingsley for me. That is, so long as the part was an Englishman. So did he uh, immediately accept? Was there a... There was a sort of a short and frightening delay. <clears throat> Uh, when I sent it to his agent, and during that delay I considered some very drastic alternatives, such as changing the nationality of the character to either an Italian or an American, and then uh, eventually I got the reply saying he'd be very happy and very proud and uh, be pleased to do it, and uh, could I please write the more proper script? <laughs> so he arrived in town and said, that's it, <clears throat> this isn't a script. And uh, I had to uh, turn up one for him by Monday morning. Mm. That sort of preempted my next question: on if he, how much he actually put into it, and how much he wanted changed, amended, added, or taken out. Nothing. He just wanted to have it all down, every word of it, in advance, quite clear, and uh, and nothing left to chance, and um, so that he would know where he was with the character. It's a very, very complicated character to play. It's a very Kingsley's a very unsympathetic man and he he doesn't do very many things and Patrick's not the kind of actor who plays on people's sentiments he's a he's a very a very controlled uh, dangerous kind of actor and uh, so it was necessary for him to be able to read the whole part from beginning to end so that he would know where the shadows were going to fall if indeed they fell you know mm. and so I understood fully why he he wanted to see it all. In fact, of course, he did see it all. The script I handed him was complete. It just didn't happen, didn't say exterior so-and-so, uh, or interior so-and-so. Um, he wanted to know where the cuts would come. He wanted to know where the scene would really end. And that was a hard question to answer because the second half of the picture, the second hour of the picture, is in real time. From the time he goes on the air to the end of the, of the picture, it's real time. So. In a sense, it's one scene. Um, but of course, to approach it as an actor, he couldn't play it just as one scene. He had to play it as all the hundred different men that make up John Kingsley. Mm. So what, what was it actually like directing him instead of being on the other end of it? Excellent. He's, I mean, he's just terrific. I mean, uh, and uh, sometimes it uh, wasn't even necessary to, to use 
let alone English. It wasn't even necessary to use words. Um, I would say, cut, and he'd look up, and I would, maybe I'd be halfway through a gesture, and he'd say, and we'd go right away again, and he knew exactly what it, what it was that I was going to say, and he did it. What about yourself as Miller? Ah, poor old Miller. Well, yeah, what about... Uh, how, did you come to, how did you come to play it? Well, uh, there was a very good um, American actor uh, going to play the part. He got into some kind of difficulties of some legal nature the night before, and uh, I, the first shot I needed him for, the very, very first shot required that he cross a border. And you can't go through uh, immigration um, if you've got um, problems. So I, uh, I didn't know how long it would take the problems to be, get resolved. Uh, and I tried to replace him um, for the next 15 hours until, until it was the middle of the early hours of the morning. And eventually it was, there was no point in trying anymore. It was McGowan, in fact, who pointed out uh, that it could go on forever and I might as well just give in. And, uh, just go down and put the gear on, whatever was in the wardrobe department for that character, and say the words when the time came. It wasn't certainly something I wanted to do in addition to all the other things. It was rather like, you know, uh, there's only so much room on, on your head for... <laughs> so, I mean, there's one thing that interests me about the film. There's a lot of um, anti-terrorist sentiment in the film, and yet the most sympathetic character in the movie is Miller. I mean, was that always intended that way, or was that just because of this change? Well, is that right? Did you find him the... Yeah, absolutely. Really? I mean, he's, for me, anyway, he was the most sympathetic character, and yet the rest of the picture seems to be telling me other things, and I thought it was interesting that I liked him more than anyone else, and believed in him more than anyone else. Um, is that, was that, would that have been the same if another guy had played, if the original guy had played it, or was that something maybe that happened? No, maybe that happened because I played it. The original guy was a good foot shorter than Patrick, and um, probably 150 pounds lighter. And uh, the difference between them physically would have been so astronomical that maybe Miller might have come over as more of a weirdo or something, and uh, perhaps that would have been too extreme. Patrick has always maintained that it worked out far better this way, mm -hmm. he thought, the balance between the two men. What was your real uh, interest in making a film about that kind of thing? I mean, what was it that you were... What was the most important thing about that picture to you in terms of what it had to say or...? Well, I was... I was fascinated and perplexed by the number of times that I opened the paper and discovered people stepping out of crowds and shooting the governor of Alabama or anybody in particular. And, uh, and also by strange things like 92% of all homicides in America are unsolved because they're done by people who aren't professional criminals. They get on airplanes, normal people, travel 500 miles, shoot somebody, get back on the airplane and go home. And uh, we're living in a very peculiar time and uh, uh, kind of a... It, it's something you don't sense so much in Europe, but you, you sense it in America and especially in the West, a time of uh, faithlessness, you might say. And it's hard to know who's running the show. It's kind of like the prisoner, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the surface symptoms of that are an uneasiness in, 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 in people. And at the extreme fringes of society, there are a greater and greater number of people behaving in a very strange way. There's a lot of, um, as maybe uh, you could see in Fallout, there's a lot in the film of scattered religious imagery and signs and symbols which I've never really been clear about in King's how it works and what... Yes, what neither have I. Um, <laughs> I, I, sh I seem to have been unable at a certain stage to pass a church without stopping the truck and taking a shot of it. And, um, and without knowing why. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I went a long way back to the town where I'd seen that church with a red neon cross at the top. There was something about that that was... I don't know. I went back anyway to photograph it and discovered that it, ha it was cordoned off and there were hostages being held in the courthouse across from it. So well, that was handy. 
I got some shots of the cordons and the cops, and I got the church. There's quite a lot of um, technical innovation in Kings in various, various kinds of levels. The sound, the sound is extremely complex, uh, multi-layered. Um, can you just say something about the kind of ambitions you had technically for the film? Well, the biggest single problem was this. If you were talking to someone, even someone you knew very, very well, whose voice you know very well, your mother or son or husband or wife, and you split their sentence, and even a perfectly ordinary sentence like, good morning, it's a nice day today, in such a way that part of it comes over a telephone receiver, part of it comes out of a radio, part of it is in person, lies, as it were. Part of it is out of a speaker in a shopping plaza. The line is indecipherable. It just, the ear will not absorb that information. The eye is a much more sensitive instrument, seems to be able to absorb all sorts of things. The ear won't adjust to that, and you won't hear the line. Well, I knew that I couldn't tell the story if I was going to have to stick around and make a whole line here, and then a whole line here, and after a while you'd be able to tell, oh yeah, now he's going outside, and now you so I had to figure out a way to try and be able to move around freely, visually, while people went on talking, because the broadcast never stops. Even when Kingsley's not on the air, there are jingles, commercials, uh, uh, news flashes. And that was the hardest part. And, um, and uh, there, was a, there was a certain amount of innovation and pioneering done in that. We invented something called the back lap, which won't make any sense to anybody. But normally, what would happen is you would have a sound, a soundtrack, which would be a, like a roll of film, and on that soundtrack would be, say, the voice of Kingsley saying, "Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Kingsley on uh, station JXYL," and that's him in person. And on another track, you'd have, "Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Kingsley, uh, station JXYL." The same reading, the same performance, but twist it slightly electronically so it sounds like it's coming out of a radio. And on the third track, you would have the morning, same thing, but this time twisted again so it sounds like it's coming out of a stadium speaker. And in the theater, the mixing, the sound mixing theater, the guy brings up the different knobs as the image changes so that he sounds like he's in person or he sounds like he's coming out of the radio or he sounds like he's in a stadium. But the speed of the cuts is such that doing that still made it impossible to hear. So gadgets and devices and ways have to be found to make that less of an assault on, on, on the ear and on the eye. It was, it was a very hard, hard, hard procedure. There's also the, the interesting fact of the, um, the anti-terror squad, who I believe weren't employed. They, they were not actors. No, they, weren't. No, they were the real McCoy. These 11 guys, who are all crazy, uh, they train the British SIS and they fly around they do, and uh, they, they actually play themselves in the picture. Mm. So how were they to work with? Them? <laughs> well, they were terrific because, first of all, they don't, they don't move like actors. If you say, come into the room, they've got their... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I give you an example of, of how they are. One of them got hurt during a recent training session and was in hospital and I happened by accident to talk to the physiotherapist who was working with him and she said it's pandemonium here every afternoon at three o'clock and I said why and she said because they all come to visit him the other ten <laughs> and they're all armed <laughs> and they're all masked and they're not uniformed and they are carrying explosives and they they're completely beyond the law they're an extraordinary bunch and they live together they load their own cartridges they wouldn't trust the factory made bullet they're an unusual bunch of guys. <laughs> <laughs> so what did, uh, what say did um, McGowan actually make of it when he finally saw it? Did he actually go through the editing process? No, with you no, he honestly saw the final result. And how did he respond? He was thrilled. Uh, he was absolutely thrilled. And uh, I was delighted that he was thrilled. Um, because uh, I know he's very, very sensitive to watching himself on the screen and generally doesn't like his own work, you know, and uh, so I was very pleased, mm. pleased about the things he said about it in the press. Mm. Mm. He, he has every right to be proud. I think it's a, it's a tremendous performance. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a very, very 
what's the word? Uh, not, not courageous. It's a very, yes, it's a very risky performance. You know, he takes it right to the edge. I mean, he's an old man. You know, he started out in life to be Laurence Olivier, and he ended up being a talk show host on an AM station in North America. And on this day, mm -hmm. all those different characters come together and come out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a very risky and dangerous performance, and he takes all the chances with it. He's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Because it, in, in places, it obviously steers quite close to him anyway, so based on your knowledge of him from her work. Well, yeah, so uh, it's, that's right, and uh, that makes it, that makes it uh, even more volatile when, when it overlaps, you know. Um. As a director, did you ever have to sort of trick him or, not trick him in a nasty way, but sort of get him in the right mood? And um, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I only, I only ever had to fire it the most awful thing I ever had to do, one person, and that was the first continuity girl we had, and it was because of Patrick. The, the um, continuity girl is really supposed to just keep an eye on the set so that if the top hat was there, that's where it was, it better still be there when we take the shot from over here, you know. And a few other responsibilities, but, but really, there's an invisible line in front of the camera separating the camera and the actors. And to cross that line is really the province only of, of the director and maybe, maybe the first AD, the assistant director. Patrick was at, his, at the desk, at the transmission desk with his mic, and, and I knew, I, I could see from the way he was organizing himself that he was not going to be happy with his speech. He got himself, the camera was there, he got himself into some kind of sort of well, he had the hat on, and position, you know, and I, I, and I, and I, and I knew the signs by then that, that, that when he got himself organized that well, he was really h sort of hiding in a way. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I said, uh, oh, okay, guys, uh, uh, this is a long take. Uh, you better reload, meaning put more film in the camera in case this goes on for two hours. It was a lie. There was plenty of film in the camera, but it bought me four minutes because it takes that long for the guy to rush off, get the film, come back, and then I... And I went and I sat down in front of Pat, and, uh, and just, just said, well, I talked about the World Cup. And talked, and talked, and as we talked, gradually his hand sort of came down, and he sort of sat forward and listened, and, and I said very casually, you got anybody ready? Why don't we just go right ahead? I was still in the shot, but I was backing up, trying to act casual. Why don't we go ahead, just turn over. And at the last moment, the girl rushed forward and said, but your hand was up here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could uh, move on, on to the, um, some aspects of the prison, which I'm sure also a lot of people here like to know about. What, um, at what stage did you become involved in that production? When were you sort of brought in and how? I mean, who first called you up or... How did you actually get inveigled into this uh, crazy scheme? Dave Tomlin phoned up and said, Want to do a Western? <laughs> I said, Sure. He said, uh, Well, it isn't actually written yet. <laughs> uh, I said, Well, where is it taking place? He said, What, the writing? <laughs> And I said, uh, yeah, all right, the writing. He said, right up here at Fulham uh, Wood. Come out on Sunday, we'll do some. And I went up and he was hanging about and he had this idea and uh, for everyone was, had just wanted desperately to get out of the village just once. <laughs> and uh, this seemed to be a perfectly good way to do it. Strange thing happened. I was driving south along Big Sur from San Francisco to Los Angeles in the middle of the night on Pacific One. It's called Pacific One because the rest of it is water in Japan. And in the headlights, up came a sign that said, Harmony. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I thought, I think I lost a little of my hair. And I, I, and I stopped and I took a photograph of it to send to Dave and it said, Population 317. Eventually, I drove back and looked at it, and it's a little perfect miniature western town called Harmony. And it's for sale at the moment, the whole time. 
So did, um, had you known David before that, or he'd been recommended? Huh? Uh, how, yeah, I know Dave. Uh, I think what, oh yes, I know Dave because uh, um, Dave had been the first assistant director on a picture I had done a long time before when I was, you know, just starting out and he'd sort of saved my life. I was, it was in the uh, south of France and I, and I think I was a little the worse for wear and I was in a bar and I was about to have a serious discussion with two American sailors <laughs> and a voice behind me, I felt this sort of grip on either side of me at my elbows, and a, and a voice said, did I ever tell you the time I took on these uh, American, um, free American navvies all by myself? And I said, no, what happened? I'm thinking, no, what happened? They beat the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, say, say goodnight. And I said, goodnight. But, and, and out we went, but what wasn't apparent, and he's so incredibly strong, Dave, was that I wasn't walking. He actually had me off the ground. My feet were just... <laughs> it was like a Mickey Mouse routine. And, uh, and Dave's strength is legendary. I later discovered that he used to... He was, the, he was the official bouncer or something or peacekeeper at three American Air Force bases up in the north here. And he, the way he kept the peace was by finger wrestling. That's right. Anybody at any time. And stuff like that, you know. He's an incredibly strong, fast, and gentle, gentle man. Wonderful man. So what was the uh, what was the mood of when you got to the production and what was the kind of mood at that time? Well, the mood kind of well the mood was all right, got tense pretty fast because I got a telegram from uh, um, Patrick who was in Hollywood filming I think Ice Station Zebra uh, saying that he was taking lessons on quick draws from Sammy Davis Jr. and Steve McQueen. Now Sammy Davis Jr. does this for real. I mean he has a basement full of gear. Shammy leather holsters, electronic timers, I mean, it's a whole number. And uh, so I presumed from that, and so did Dave, that Pat really was practicing and meant this to be a showdown that wasn't going to be faked by a cut or an edit, that we really were going to have to shoot it out. So, down the Burmans. You got any guns? Well, Burmans didn't have a cold pacemaker, but eventually we found one, and I, and I went home with it, and I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced in front of the mirror. And I filed down the, the whatever the hammer, and I wired back the trigger, which I later found out was very dangerous, because apparently Robert Mitchum once blew a part of his foot off when the gun was still in the holster, because when, when the trigger is wired back, of course, there's nothing to stop the hammer from going, you know, but it's quicker that way. You only have to do that. These are single-action guns. In other words, you can't keep pulling the trigger. You have to cock them. Hence the old fanning action. So the day finally came of the showdown on the set on, in the western village built by Jack Champagne uh, Harmony. And the stuntmen had seen me doing it, and uh, some had seen Pat doing it, but never together. So there was a, a kind of... Uh, it was an element of, uh, we're not sure how this is going to work out. Uh, and uh, lots of bets were placed. A great deal of money changed hands as to who was the quicker draw, because according to the visible instructions that everyone heard the director, Dave Tomlin, give, we were just supposed to draw and fire. Uh, <laughs> however, the one thing that no one else heard, which I knew, which was what Dave said to me. Patrick came out of the sheriff's office into the sunlight and saw it. And the kid was standing there. The camera was right behind Patrick's holster. So the camera was supposed to, as Patrick drew and fired, zoom in tight and arrive at the kid just at the moment when he got Which meant that the cameraman who would have one eye shut and be looking through the eyepiece, the only cue that he could have as to how to and when to go boom, would be Patrick's removal of his gun from his holster. And then he would go in. So he'd have to arrive in time to see the kid remove his gun. So I was the only one who said who knew that I was going to let Pat draw first. Now we're talking only in fractions of a second. And, uh, and in all the takes we did, only one shot was heard, even though both guns went off. And so no one, none of the bets were paid off until the next day when 
the film came back and the film doesn't lie because they, they were able to count the number of frames and Pat had taken 11 frames and uh, to get the gun out and I had taken seven and I guess one of the six to the second difference or something. So anyway, that was the beginning. That, that was the beginning. But after that, the, the, general, the general atmosphere of, uh, of intellectual and other kinds of competitiveness, uh, healthy competitiveness, just became greater and greater. Were you given much, had you been watching the series, were you given a kind of background to what had been happening? Oh yeah, 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 I, oh yeah. I just, I didn't have to go to Port Marion though. Yeah. But did David give you briefings on what had been done? Yes, before? and showed me, we went down and showed me what he already had. So how did they justify and the then, And then, and then, well, you see, the real, the real, the real uh, thing at the time was that Angelo, the late, great Angelo, and I were going to go on without Pat and do the series, do another 39 after blowing the place up as, uh, as a kid with the, uh, the dwarf, I guess, a uh, midget or dwarf, I mean, um, anyway, with little Angelo, traveling the world, being lost forever, being strangers and hunted and pursued, and turning up in unlikely places, like at the Olympics, at the back of the marathon, there would be, followed by this little dwarf. <laughs> but, uh, but when we got to about number whatever it was, um, I, think, uh, I think everyone's energies were beginning to flag. It was a very strenuous job. So were you initially just taking on for harmony, or was there a, a sort of rider that there were other things to do, maybe? It was in the air, but uh, it didn't become tangible and, until until it became tangible and then gradually it got to the state it got so it was kind of a, a triumvirate or really a whatever the word is for four if you include Bernie Williams mm. so at some point someone asked you to come back to do these last, last yeah. crucial uh, yeah mm -hmm. the, 17 is a strange number it wasn't supposed to be 17 but one night Pat and Dave and I were were in the Red Lion or someplace in Forum Wood long after closing time and we never talked and I um, I was still too um, shy and uh, too embarrassed to, to do anything about it. Um, they had a way of standing about four foot from the bar looking straight ahead. And they'd do that from about 10 o'clock on for about three hours, and then they'd say goodnight and leave. <laughs> and I, and I, I couldn't, I, I, mean, I really couldn't, finally I couldn't take it. And then I, I cut out this Andy cap I found in the Daily Mirror or someplace in which uh, the, the familiar character with the cap got his back. You know, he's like this, you know, drinking at the bar, and a stranger comes and says, nice day, and he doesn't move, and the stranger says, uh, well, see you later, and eventually the stranger leaves, and in the last frame, the character turns and says, amateur. <laughs> but, uh, well, um, I put this over the bar, and um, that kind of, we got to talking a little bit after that, and on that particular night, uh, I think, I think Pat said we got to blow the place up. <laughs> and I said, but it's supposed to be a pass. What do you mean, blow the place up? He said, it's the easiest thing in the world. I mean, how are, you, how are we going to get rid of all of all? I mean, just, just kill them. And I said, but Pat, it's, isn't this a pacifist type? Of, aren't we, uh, um, you know, machine guns? And he said, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the only way out of this. And, um, and, um, and, it, and it, it, it kind of, I know it sounds a kind of a, a strangely facetious moment, but it wasn't. It was a, it was a moment that obviously was born of a very long period of hardship on his part, work and creative energy, and so he had the right to sort of make that kind of instant judgment. And, and, and we all eventually developed the right to make strange discoveries, you know. For example, the, 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 the death of Rover. Um, am I talking too much? Well, okay, the, death, the, well, the death of Rover was very weird because uh, um, the, 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 the special effects people had created various ways and, and, and apparently they weren't satisfactory. Well, I was doing take number 198 of uh, rushing around, jumping over, and I found out later Pat had bribed the stuntman a fiver to the first guy who put his hand on me. and. Each take ended with me landing on my spine, on my, right in front of him, a young man! <laughs> and I was beginning to be in agony, and uh, I'd started to drink tea with 
about eight spoons of sugar and a small hit of cognac in it. But he was giving me less and less time between takes to catch my breath. So I reached down, because the place was full of dry ice and carbon dioxide for all that steam effect and the cold, and I grabbed a piece of dry ice so I could quickly down my damn tea, and I, without thinking, I dropped the dry ice in it, and an awful, awful thing appeared on the surface of this tea. A bubble, and then another bubble, and then a sort of whole bunch of little bubbles, and I kind of went, <laughs> and I said, Pat, Pat, and he came up, and he said, that's it, what is it? It's seven spoons of sugar, so much cream, and a sort of... <laughs> that was the, uh, and that was the death of Rover. Well, presumably there was at some, there was at some point a script. I mean, there was a script for... Oh, a yes, script. yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. He, and I think he wrote, he wrote the script for Pollock very fast. I think he wrote it in an airplane or, or, and was still writing it as we went. Um. So how much was the script um, played around with or <laughs> um, is it all pretty much laid down? Let's see. Well, the big question, of course, about who was going to be number one, who was going to turn out to be number one, was uh, was not really resolved in the script. Partly because we all had different opinions about it. Um, I seriously thought that Pat ought to rip the mask off and it ought to be Lou Grade, but um, nobody else thought that was funny. And, uh, and uh, but I guess what everybody knew was that it was going to have to be somehow the most horrible thing was that it was going to have to be a, an everyman, and no one knew how to get an everyman, and only. Um, I think only in the editing was it suddenly clear that the, that the, that the best mask, the, the final mask, the everyman, was that he himself was number one. So they shoot several versions to get around it. Yeah, well, there was ways around. There were, they, they could have cut, cut, cut other ways out of it, but I, I mean, in, with hindsight, there's no other way it could have ended. I, I can't imagine uh, an ending as appropriate as that was. Does that mean there was a lot of post-production time on that episode? Lots of editors? Well, there was an awful lot of editors, but not much time, which is why there were so many editors, because they were already running it in America. We were still shooting it ten days before they were due to air it somewhere. And um, it, it uh, I mean, I don't think that any editor ever got to see all the footage, even. It was a, a very great rush. And I, at the time, it was the most, probably the most, maybe it still is the most expensive 54 minutes of television ever made. The set for Fallout occupied two entire sound stages, which are the size of aircraft hangars, in, uh, at MGM, at Borum Wood. And all of 2001 was off in the corner somewhere. <laughs> So did, did Pat actually go, f go to all the editing? Did he supervise the editing a lot? What happened after it all been shot? And in the case of Fallout? Fallout um, well, I think in the case of Fallout, there wasn't much time for any delicacy. I think uh, everyone just worked, and editors were given specific sequences, and they were told to just do that bit, and you do that bit, and you do that bit, and then we'll join all the bits together. You do Leo McKern's bit, and you do the kids' bit. And, um, so... Uh, there was no, uh, there was no, there was no time to lavish love on the cutting of Fallout as there was uh, in the case, for example, of Living in Harmony, which was, which was cut with, with great love by uh, by Dave and the editor, and 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 the two-hander between Leo and Pat, which is absolutely brilliant. In fact, it would work as a stage play, wouldn't it? So what did what was the feeling like when it was all over and? Uh Edited. I mean, did anyone run for cover? Or, I mean, how well, everyone ran. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we were sort of grateful <laughs> that it was over. Um, I, um, I had started to not bother to go home. And uh, there was no point, really, because by the time uh, Pat and I would finish playing squash in a deserted schoolhouse in Mill Hill at 2 o'clock in the morning, it was only two hours away from when I was due back, so... I was staying in a kind of pseudo health farm somewhere nearby, and uh, 
in the mornings at about 4.30 or 5. I'd always try to be the first in. I'd arrive in the dark at the studio. And no matter how early I got there, there was this robed figure at the top of the stairs, already there in the dark. And Pat would say, good morning. How do you feel? I'd say, mm -hmm. and he'd say, good, because it's going to be another day of indescribable brutality. <laughs> and one morning I, I, I came in. We had two rooms side by side, and the entire corridor, the rest of the corridor was empty. One day I, I came in, and there was a sign just beyond my room. I passed his and came to mine, and then there was a sign saying, beware, dangerous animal, which I wondered, maybe they should have put the sign on, but, but uh, it turned out, anyway, that that was Stanley Kubrick's leopard from 2001 was in the next dressing room who turned out to be a pussycat and they fired him. They, <laughs> they fired that leopard, yeah. He didn't. Why? Because I think the leopard was gay or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they got one that went, rah, as opposed to, <laughs> Did you, um, did you have any ambitions of your own for the prisoner? Like, you know, this is a, if you presume you had some leeway so you could make a stamp maybe or, I mean, was there anything that you wanted out of it or was it all kept very tight well, under the Well, I, 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 I began to um, have great sympathy with this generation of kids that, uh, uh, was being summed up, um, and um, and I was and I and I must say, um, even though I, I ended up sleeping for two weeks afterwards in that health farm, I, I would probably have done uh, the next series with Angelo uh, if any of the original team could have faced it, but none of them could have faced it. Not even the first AD could face it. Um, it was very, very, very strenuous. Yeah, he went to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think he went that quick? Was he expecting trouble? No, I think he was. I think he was real tired, real tired. Well, he put out an awful lot of himself. You know, he'd, uh, he'd only agreed to do the last thirty-nine or whatever it was, Danger Men, on the condition that he could do this other thing, and. So when it came to do this other thing, he put an awful lot into it and, uh, and finally was exhausted. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's quite open. <coughs> Yes, I hoped very much that uh, that, that would happen. Um, but you know, you just don't know until until you uh, until the audience is there. That's what's terrifying about about film. And I guess that's why in the old days, people like the Marx Brothers used to take their film scripts on tour and do them live out somewhere in the boonies and practice everything and make sure that they knew how to make it work before they then went back and filmed the scene at the circus where what's his face cons Groucho or whatever but it, you don't know until you get an audience there and the other scary thing is that the first few times a picture is shown it's generally shown to studio executives or, 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 or sort of so called experts and that means a screening room with 20 or 25 people in it which at which you're lucky if half the movie comes over. But when you get a couple of hundred people or 500 or 800 people just tittering, that's a loud sound and it's infectious. And then you, only then do you know that, that it's working. Um, it, it, it looks completely different, by the way, to me with an audience than it does without one. Totally different. It must have been quite a strain playing Hamlet at Stratford during the evenings and uh, filming connecting rooms during the day. Did you ever find that when you were playing Hamlet that uh, you'd dry and have to ad-lib Shakespeare? No, but I, 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 uh, I, I, I did uh, know an actor who uh, had a perfectly set speech of 14 lines, sonnet length, in blank verse, all about 
the sky and the clouds that come and the rain that falls and the clouds that clear and the sun that emerges that he could put in anywhere. And <laughs> whenever he was in trouble, he used it and no one ever noticed. <laughs> I don't suppose you, you knew where the um, name Everyman Studios came from. Everyman Productions? Everyman Productions. No, I don't, but uh, it's interesting that the word everyman came up earlier in the conversation. So maybe there's probably there's some connection. So, yes, I mean, I think they, they were trying to make a statement for as many people as possible. In the uh, first part of the film, um, it's very, very exciting because there were so many cuts all the time. And it gradually eased off as uh, Patrick started to take control of the situation as opposed, you know, to the terrorists. Is that something you deliberately aimed for? Yes, because I knew that there would be a long-ish period after the hostages were taken and before they went on the air when it would be fairly normal-paced scenes, night, dialogue, scenes between men, things that happen and, and, and that, that if I didn't, right up front, do, do something to prepare the audience for the style that was going to come later in the broadcast, then it would be like changing the rules in midstream. So that the first 20 minutes was the only chance to, to do that, to warm the audience to what eventually the picture was going to be about. And the credits at the end of the film, the credits to uh, Doris Cannon. Is that your mother? Yes. She was one of the housewives in the window. She wanted to sit in the middle, but she... <laughs> <laughs> But she had, she had been to the beauty parlor and, um, <laughs> and refused to wear the hair curler, so she had been. Speaking of the the editor, Henry Lucas, I've never noticed his name before on, on a film with an editor. Where did you find him? Um, he's an Australian, um, and um, I think he's back in Australia, and I think he's directing. He's a, very good, a very good editor. Brilliant editor. Did you prefer playing the kid in Living Harmony or number 48 in Fallout? Do you, do you enjoy one role more than the other? Well, um, actors are funny. Actors are vain and they remember the wrong things. Um, I remember that I could never really get the note and hear the word of the Lord the way I could do it in the bathroom. <laughs> On the other hand, I also remember that when the judge came into the sheriff's office in Harmony and threw, threw the kid out of the chair asleep, that I was able to turn in the air and come up with two guns in my hand. And I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> uh, but, but those are the wrong things to remember, I, I'm sure. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there was a director that uh, had approached by accident myself and Patrick to do a picture together as two brothers, or a kid brother, an older brother in a war or something, and uh, Patrick had said, I don't want to do it and I don't think you should either and I said why what's the matter with him and Pat had said well his hip bone ain't connected to his thigh bone in the same way yours and mine is so when I read the script of Fallout the first thing I saw there was all about hip bones and thigh bones <laughs> I had some I, I wasn't sure whether I was having my leg pulled or not but uh, I was quite clear I wasn't <laughs> um. Was it decided from the very beginning that the kid should be silent in living in harmony, or did he originally have to dialogue? There was uh, very little, but there was some. But uh, the uh, the primary things that the kid did were non-verbal, so it became it became very apparent that he didn't need to say anything. It would have been actually quite interesting if the modern-day character, when the story reverts. To the present time had also been in some way mute 
But, of course, it was not possible to do that because he was a scientist of some sort, I guess, uh, uh, a mad scientist. I preferred the kid to the scientific character. He was sort of virtually summoned at the very end where he got so caught up in the character that he'd been playing. He yes, when he, when he really tried to kill the, the girl. Yes. You see an exterior shot, and you hear this horrific scream. And at first, I suppose you assume that it's Kathy, the girl that's being screamed, and then you realise it's the kid screaming. Whose idea was that? I mean, that's a really horrific scene, nasty sound. Is that your idea? Was it Pat's? Or it... Uh, no, I think um, Living in Harmony was supposed to be a classic of all the prototypical characters, the kid the judge corrupt the girl the man with no name but has a badge and so for the kid to be a psychopath and so on uh it was necessary to find ways to do old things in a fresh and original and hopefully alarming fashion and and that was one of the things that emerged uh um you know, to refresh basically an old-fashioned character. Uh. Do you have any thoughts on why it is that sometimes, you know, say with the prisoner, somebody becomes a hero and then you know, to the audience, the, the whole thing, the power of the media, you know, the effect it has on the person watching. Well, apart from apart from playing a part that has that has enormous sympathy or mystery, like Lawrence, say, in, in Lawrence of Arabia, there are also certain actors who bring something along when they play a part that makes them makes you remember them and um, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example of, uh, of that I, I was I was almost about to say East of Eden and, and James Dean but m maybe not because there are, that was a part that was made to do that to you anyway. But I, I suspect he would have done that to you if he'd played, uh, if he'd played the judge in Fallout. Uh, there's something about him that, 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 that was touching, no matter what he did. And the interesting thing is that the lens sees something different than the person sees. Orson Welles told me that he sat enraptured by the camera and watched Garbo being filmed and couldn't believe how dull she was. <laughs> and went ne the next day to see the dailies on screen of the, the previous day's work on film and said she was magical. And he said it was a mystery. It was a mystery to him. He was right beside the camera like that, but obviously the lens loved her in some way. Yes. Oh, yes. That's pretty much what I do to pay my my bread and butter. Um, what other uh, films and television work have you done, and do you have a particular favourite or favourites? Well, the I have a there's a picture I did called the Ernie Game, which was one of the few pictures which, when I went to see it, was about what I thought it had been about when I was making it. Uh, generally, uh, the experience of going to the opening night was discovering that they'd been making some other movie. And uh, so I was happy with that. And The Prisoner. I think, uh, maybe too soon to say, I should touch wood, Kings and Desperate Men. Um, and, I, and, I, and I also enjoyed challenges. The things that were that were where where we started out as underdogs. For example, the cat with ten lives was a pure underdog situation. Uh, in fact, it was a phone call from uh, Lou Grade, now Lord Lou, uh, who said that he was having problems selling this television series to the Americans. Before that, you see, these people who made this series had 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 this wonderful program with puppets, and the puppets acted like people. Now, they had this wonderful program with people in which they acted like <laughs> puppets. 
So Dave and I went down and looked at several episodes of these people acting like puppets and said, well, we'll go up and we'll try and make a sh one for you that you maybe can take to America and use as a sales item to sell the whole series with. So basically, one was written that was, that's why I say it wasn't fun to be an underdog. One was written to somehow eliminate the puppet characters and star a cat, get as many new faces in as possible and keep them on. And, uh, and cast it as well as possible. In fact, I saw last night for the first time since then the actor who played one of the other astronauts, Stephen Burkhoff, in that. And uh, it, was a, it was a good cast. And in fact, Lord Lou did take that episode over to America and, sell, and sold the series with it. Somewhere recently, I was told, he also released the rest of the footage in Italy as a movie called The Cat with Ten Lines. this all these years I've been showing to appreciate the series. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I do. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a believer in Doomsday and Ar Armageddon and, uh, and, and, and I'm really basically an optimist and I have enormous faith. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very hard to overlook certain things going on not only in America, but here, and wondering uh, where the power really is and whether we are being manipulated and to what extent. Uh, and so uh, a group like this that has a particular passion for a series about an outsider against a system, an unspecified system, is I think a very healthy and positive thing and to be encouraged. I don't know exactly who actually gives the orders down on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The guy who's got the job is playing his part to perfection. <laughs> but I don't know who gives the orders. Is the kid living in Harmony and uh, the character, number, number 48 and Crawler, supposed to be the same character? And if not, uh, who is number 48? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's two centuries later. Um, and rebellious and uh, equally confused but not violent. I mean, he's thumbing a ride this way and he's thumbing a ride this way. I mean, um, I, I think that uh, that's, that's the only real resemblance between the two. But there is, I mean, there is, there is a connection. Well, uh, that has come out of the woodwork a couple of times. Um, a very well-known, famous director-producer team uh, appeared last year in California and uh, phoned and my agent called me and said they were interested in making a prisoner show and I said, well, do they understand that this would have to be Patrick's show. And he said, well, I'm not sure they understand that. I said, well, you better tell them, because I meant... <laughs> uh, so uh, so that, that's, there's that rumor. The, the other rumor is this one about somebody's locked off Port Marion and, not, and filming is not going to be permitted there or something for the next couple of years, and neither Pat nor I know anything about that. And the third, uh, more substantial, is that Pat has... Uh, worked on and we've discussed and met and looked at and torn up pages and there is in fact uh, material for uh, a picture which if the mood strikes him he'll make <laughs> it's set by the way today but it's still it's still a, it's, a, it's, a, it's as ahead of its time in 84 as, the, as it was then Thank you.